hello, that's me again. Today is the 7th uh, of March and I want to start with congratulating and wishing the best to uh, all women who watch my uh, channel and this is the International Women's Day. Many people, for example, do not understand that despite the fact that it was essentially communist kind of progressive um, uh, holiday which was pushed through by the initial first wave feminists such as Clara Zetkin and um, Rosa Luxemburg uh, that, for example, in Russia it long ago lost its any kind of the proletarian or class struggle meaning, and I'm talking about even in Soviet times, and it became just the holiday of uh, the spring and love for women. That's it. That's why women are praised and extolled in Russia this day. They are given their flowers and actually are uh, uh, constantly shown the signs how they appreciate it, uh, are being appreciated by men as women, not as some kind of feminists or some kind of political agenda bearers, but namely as women, as mothers, as and you what you do, you go and you you know wish your mothers, those who are alive, wives, girlfriends, you know, just all those signs of the attention. You give them flowers, some gifts. And in, in essence, it has nothing to do anymore with any kind of feminism, but it has only with the praising and admiring woman as a woman, not as some uh, binary, what, uh, how, I, I'm not going to go there. I'm not good into this uh, pseudoscience of the uh, feminism, so, and uh, that's what it is. So my congratulations, and I wish you to stay healthy and be beautiful and, you know what, and con continue to control your husbands as you, what you usually do. Anyhow, here is the situation. I wanted to start today with the analysis, and but as always, my God, we always have to run into some kind of um, uh, unexpected headlines, and this is becoming the cottage industry for me on the sitting and debunking the shit and uh, crap which is being spewed by the uh, Western media, and including also some Russian media, because they also spew a lot of uh, bullshit, make shit up, and... Uh, that's probably the nature of the business because 90 percent of people who work in media anywhere they are not good people those are people who are leeches and they have no morals or ethics those exquisite 10 percent of real journalists and real reporters are the very uh, you know uh, exquisite and sadly disappearing breed for the most part we have to deal with the all kinds of um People who won't be uh, allowed to loan my, uh, to mow my uh, loan, for example, because they have no skills, no nothing. So, but let's go. Uh, and there is a lot of controversy already uh, in kind of analytical circles today, uh, circles today, uh, uh, for people who really do analyze it. But let's start with this thing, and this is New York Times. And New York Times suddenly uh, gets us into their, uh, this, oh my God, sensational uh, headline. We know it's all bullshit because New York Times is the uh, basically tabloid now. And it's basically propaganda outlet for the Biden and Obama regime. But look what they say. They say now suddenly that, oh my God, intelligence suggests pro-Ukrainian group sabotage sabotage pipeline u.s officials say and they begin to explain that really new intelligence just came up you know and that people those officials are, are always anonymous we know that they begin to ask questions like oh my god we, had, we had, you know discovered those things now and it looks like it points towards ukraine some people i'm not gonna uh uh, uh name their names because i respect them tremendously but they think that uh, actually that's probably nothing more than just uh, basically their response to Cy Hirsch article, the piece about the United States basically being behind the, uh, the explosion of the Nord Stream 2. And it, it's clear that it is. I mean, everybody knows that who, anybody who didn't lose their brain. And, um, but to demonstrate to you that it is a little bit more than just merely uh, countering Cy Hirsch's piece, Guess what we get? We get also the um, uh, headline from uh, German side, who actually directly blames Ukraine. 
And they even provide some bizarre, uh, obviously most likely made up uh, crap about that, you know, uh, German investigative journalists and German <clears throat> special services, their intelligence, they figure out that it was the, some kind of the Ukrainian company which rented the, some kind of ship went out there and blew up the Nord Stream too, and you know what, so all in all, they begin to also basically direct the whole thing towards Ukraine, because it's implied. No matter how you turn it, no matter how you spin it, no matter what you try to do, whenever you look at what they, uh, uh, whatever they say, it all points into one direction. They are beginning to blame Ukraine for that. And this is not accidental. Obviously, Mr. Scholz uh, uh, came to Washington recently not to uh, defend uh, German uh, inter national interest because they don't know what it is and Germany is now reduced to their third, uh, third rate power and uh, obviously Scholz was discussing how to handle uh, the situation but there is also you cannot deny the fact that we are talking about it against the background of massive massive ukrainian losses and defeats along the whole line of the front and with it we are looking at the situation when the united states needs to face the reality even if we talk about such incompetent and delusional people uh, as people in Biden's administration or Obama people who run it from behind because none of them I mean if you look at those people be that um, modern crop of ranging from Blinken to Susan Rice in Obama administration those are incompetent they are ignoramuses they, they cannot plan shit basically and of course their plan goes haywire despite that fact that some not all some american uh, military people warned them i warned about this for, for nine years now you don't know what you're getting yourself into but hey what do i know they are all graduated from this fake degree meals in ivy league you know with all degrees in communications and journalism and political science but but look at this uh, this uh, situation uh, this change of tone with direct uh, blame uh, blaming of Ukraine and whitewashing what amounts to state terrorism because blowing up the pipeline of the strategic import it's state terrorism plain and simple uh, obviously they need to do something and guess what this all well co uh, coincides with this let me show you this are a few days ago photographs of yet another batch of the uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, armed forces of Ukraine POWs taken by Russian forces there. And as you can see yourself, two of the left guys are basically children. We're looking at what, 17 years old? The guy on the right, he's after his 60s, man. These are prisoners of four of the armed forces of Ukraine, which Ukraine continues to feed into Bakhmut while losing it because it's de facto, de facto lost. And these are the kids and the old people because they basically run out of proper personnel and again i would have concentrated more on the tactical minutia not that i really care about it but you can look at this today's uh, uh map of by the russian ministry of defense it's in russian but look at this i underscored uh, in um underlined in red just uh, uh morning um uh, uh for the summons of uh, March, just March tally, so to speak, and you can see yourself at Kupiansk. You already, I'm not talking about the equipment which being destroyed on, in industrial quantities every day, but look at this in the personnel on Kupiansk on the north, more than in uh, excess of 30 uh, uh, KIAs from uh, armed forces of Ukraine, uh, Red Liman uh, up to 225. On the uh, South Donetsk and Zaporozh direction, operation direction, more than 60 killed. Uh, Donetsk uh, the direction, more than 75 killed. On the quiet Kherson <laughs> direction, up to 35 killed. Planes are being shot down every day. And of course, the uh, armored um, uh, armor is being also annihilated really effectively so when you begin to calculate it it's like oh my god in this day they basically wiped out more than 330 people from their uh, uh battle order in uh, uh ukraine this is uh 
and we already can see uh, the basic faces of those people and uh, as people from uh, uh, Bakhmut report and again I want to make kind of a little bit of uh, uh, how to say it uh, off topic uh, it's not just Wagner which fights, fights in Bakhmut people have to understand that Mr. Prigozhin may say whatever he wants and he is definitely very uh, well, outstanding man and his uh, fighters are excellent storm fighters. Uh, Wagner was specifically trained to fight in the uh, urban environment. It is obviously a Russian army which provides all those uh, wonderful surrounding and support and artillery, aviation, uh, uh, C4, ISR and things of this nature. So, and uh, uh, even today, uh, Mr. Alaudinov, who is the uh, commander of the Chechen battalion, well, it's not battalion, it's actually a regiment, almost brigade there, and, uh, but he is now in hospital because there was an attempt on his life. He already stated that uh, the number of POWs is horrendous there. And from what we know, what's left in Bakhmut or being fed is about 13. Some people say 13, others say 10 brigades, but some say that it's... 10,000 trapped now, others say that it's 25,000 trapped there now, and they cannot really escape because basically they are in full-blown operational envelopment and there are no roles. If you look at the photographs there, oh my gosh. And that brings us to this very important thing, which as I already stated, coincides perfectly with this article, both in Zeit and both in New York Times, and then of course, I will throw in another piece of news, even in uh, Asia Times, which is kind of on the, you know, not friendly <laughs> to Russia. Look at this. They also say Ukraine is going to lose the window of opportunity for settlement has closed. And the author explains yesterday that there is a notion floating around the internet that the current conflict in Ukraine is going to remain static war of attrition that will bleed Russian army dry. And he explains, those believing these narratives are living in fantasy. Well, we need to understand that most of the internet, which is related today to a special military operation, is populated with the shysters, fanboys, and mama boys, gamers, and all uh, other people who try to make, make basically a uh, career on that and monetize them. Uh, most of them will not know shit from Shinola. They are absolutely militarily illiterate, and the only thing they left for them is to comment on some shiny pieces of military equipment and indeed come up with the you know this tactical minutia that how oh my god you know you move the left you know five meters to avoid being you know targeted by this or that sniper which it's like yeah sure sure yeah you know what and uh obviously those people have no clue what uh uh, operation and strategy is and one of my uh, uh, followers think uh, thanks for him although he made a little bit of grammatic mistake he told he said me this and said you know what uh, that's what Martianov does all, uh, does all the time and there you go this is your hypnotod you know and wars are won and lost on the operational and strategic levels people has to get this into their minds before before they begin to understand the real war but that's the whole point that's what I'm always on the record that operations are very complex thing and especially mathematics which is behind it it, it takes uh, it requires a special military education some experience and the more experience the better and staff experience is also crucial so when you look at this like mm, okay and then we have this wowzer this is finally we can uh state it uh, that this is what is this all about here it is mr austin yesterday he actually states now this Pentagon chief downplays importance of besieged Donbass city, which is Artyomovsk, Bakhmut. And uh, the question is, why does he do this? Here it is. The what he says, it's, uh, hey, it's said death, guys. It's the Secretary of Defense. The city of Artyomovsk or Bakhmut, as it is known by Ukraine, is one of more symbolic than operational importance, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin claimed on Monday, according to Reuters. Well, what can I say? He had to do this because obviously there, when we will get the full number of the losses of armed forces of Ukraine, and they will be horrendous. I mean, just absolutely horrendous. And 
uh, and uh, Bakhmut is still kind of not 100% uh, uh, you know cleaned but it will be uh, in coming days but uh, uh, even Mr. Shaigu today the F Minister of Defense of Russian Federation while uh, congratulating uh, 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 Russian women and especially service women uh, of Russian armed forces, in, in, including those uh, those women who fight in uh, in their uh, front zone, in the combat zone, he stated that actually they're uh, very conservative. And again, Russian defense ministry is extremely conservative in its numbers. Just February alone, the KIAs alone for the uh, armed forces of Ukraine amounted to in excess, and I quote, in excess of 11,000. So you may, you can easily multiply by three, we'll have another 33, uh, 30,000 uh, wounded. So you add together, you have about in excess of 40,000 uh, losses, both KIAs and sanitary. And again, these are not the final numbers because I think so in terms of the KIAs around Bakhmut alone, we're looking at some horrendous numbers. And as you can see yourself, even Russian Defense Ministry CTRAP, uh, which I showed you with the map, it kind of gets it about this number. And again, those are very conservative numbers. That is why Russians say in excess or up to, because in excess of 10, 11,000, it could be actually 18,000. We don't know. And they don't know yet precisely, and we will know the numbers uh, later. But under any circumstances, this is the type of the war which nobody in Washington ever, and I already mentioned Mr. Cavoli, who is the Supreme Commander in Europe, nobody there from those Obama and Biden people understood and expected. And now when they have this whole kind of snowfall, if you wish, of their both uh, state terrorism, which is of course blowing the North Stream too, they have now these horrendous consequences and ramifications and they basically lost the war there. It's lost. I mean, we know that it's just a matter of how it will be rearranged, so to speak, after the Ukraine factually ceases to exist. So they now expected this. And again, they are panicking. And that's why I disagree with some people who say that, oh, actually this uh, article in New York Times was the thing to counter Cy Hirsch's uh, piece about Nord Stream 2. Well, actually it is, obviously. Part of it is definitely is, but this is the ramifications and implications of, of this are much wider. It's not just uh, the countering of Cy Hirsch's piece, because why would you not counter it? Because evidently it's truth, but because obviously any exposition of the truth, it bears the horrendous strategic ramifications, including for the internal policy in the the United States and those people in the United States who run today this Biden's regime and who are this swamp or whatever deep state those people they cannot plan that's what many people don't understand they still say oh yeah you know what that but in those back rooms as I already elaborated on this they still say smart things and they go out and go out what to do stupidest things you ever encounter in your life unprecedented we never saw anything like this. This is a sheer geopolitical stupidity and incompetence. And that's what we have to come up, uh, you know, come down with our conclusions because this is what it is. They are morons, literally. They cannot reset anything. They cannot run anything. You cannot run anything when you have degree in communications or in political science. You have nothing to offer in terms of the serious uh, academic life or let alone military operational experience. Good God. And we also have to go into the technological field. Those people don't understand machines. They don't. They are not taught what machines are. While in reality, we live in the world dominated by machines. Military machines are the most complex machines in history. It's simple as that. Nuclear powered submarine is more complex than International Space Station. Much more complex. And so that brings us to this other thing, which is, of course, I wanted to uh, concentrate more on it today, but sadly uh, I couldn't. But let me put it this way. Uh, just to demonstrate to you to what degree the, of degeneracy and imbecility general American academia fell, we can take a look at, uh, uh, let me see where this uh, whole thing is. Uh, 
it's James Town Foundation, uh, they call themselves conservatives, they're not conservatives, they are uh, neoliberal, bullshitters, anti-Russian and Russophobic. And look at this, they published this study about Russia's questionable naval modernization during wartime. And look at this, uh, and uh, uh, so it's basically a repetition of all kind of bullshit and open source thing, but it's, uh, look who wrote it. Uh, the guy by the name of Pavel Luzin, yes, I know, Luzin, I think so, he misspelled his name, it should be Pavel, L-O-O-Z-I-N-G, and guess what, these are the types of creeps and morons who actually continue to write bullshit about Russia, and look at the, the curriculum vitae of this creep. Uh, he is a doctorate in international relations from the Institute of World Economy and International Relations, he is an expert on Russian politics, defense affairs and global security. Dr. Lusion studies these fields for Regal Media. Previously he covered these issues for presidential campaign of Alexei Navalny. So in another way the guy is the asset, he is a piece of crap who has no idea what he's talking about, but guess what? He continues to write and guess what how he writes about it because obviously he has absolutely zero physics, mathematics, engineering, and military background to assess anything, but he basically gathers all kinds of the, you know, open source bullshit and juxtaposition it for some pseudo-academic uh, uh, outlets like Jamestown, and of course he, as you might expect, he completely uh, fails to describe the situation with the Russian Navy modernization because, and if you go back to my video about Russian submarines and Russian corvettes and Russian frigates, you will see yourself that actually the tempo of Russian milit uh, naval uh, modernization is increasing and when you look attentively especially the nuclear powered submarine component it's astonishing United States uh, in terms of the submarine development is nowhere near especially when you consider the fact that Russia operates a massive I mean massive diesel electric uh, uh, submarine force and much of its submarine force is state-of-the-art and armed with the state-of-the-art weaponry and when you begin to look at this, this is like, oh my gosh, and yet those people continue to uh, employ these shysters. And, you know, those shysters, uh, I describe them a lot, including, for example, Mr. Bismanov, uh, which everybody likes to point out. I have an excellent um, um, review by Mr. Bismanov by actually professional people, uh, American professional people. You can look it up in my... Um, blog. And so when you begin to look at this, you can see the signs of panic and the signs of now throwing the blame around, which are absolutely omnipresent. You cannot miss them. To demonstrate to you how bad it is, uh, let me show you, because it's not only uh, basically uh, concentrated on, on the issues of just military affairs or war or special military operation rather in uh, in Ukraine, but look at this. If you look at this, uh, for example, uh, fresh yesterday's headline: Russia remains India's top oil supplier for fifth months in a row. India keeps on taking major volumes of Russian oil, as the latest data suggests. Moscow supplies at present around 35 percent of India's total import, in stark contrast to less than one percent before the Ukraine war. Based on the data provided by consultancy, Vortex and India imported around 1.62 million uh, barrels per day in February from Russia. These record levels are almost the same as India's imports from Iraq, Saudi Arabia combined. So this uh, is the thing which uh, they cannot hide. You cannot hide it. It's out there. And here's another thing. The United States uh, definitely won their uh, uh, European gas market. It most likely it did. The problem, of course, for people who do not understand how Russian economy uh, operates, and this is most of the people in the U.S. Academy and uh, U.S. think tanks and policy decision makers, it's uh, the fact that uh, actually uh, gas is not even the main article among the uh, resources, uh, minerals uh, export of Russia. It is oil. Russia makes killing in oil even today. And this price cap is, I mean, it's preposterous. Yeah, they established uh, this price cap of $60 per barrel. Russia sells it for 74 and higher. 
And uh, there are so many takers there that in this particular case, okay, at some point of time, Russia will reorient all of its gas uh, uh, streams towards China, which is buying Russian gas like crazy, especially the power of Siberia too is uh, being under construction. So, and suddenly what you're left with, you will be left for the United States with insolvent Europe. And even if the gas prices fall, which they will maybe, you know what? It's still going to be several times more than they used to have it. And that means what? Increase insolvency in Europe, not to mention the fact of the suicidal green policies, which will completely destroy uh, European economy, and not to speak about uh, Germany, which is all being used now as the, well, it's a slab beach, basically. That's what it is. It, 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 Germany doesn't have any more national pride or national sovereignty. It is a complete U.S. lab dog, and that's how it will die out as the industrial power. So they can forget about Russian uh, energy, no matter how they try to obtain it. And when you look at this, uh, uh, you know, you just begin to look at the fact that people who conduct policies, for example, in the United States, they do not understand this. Look at this. Yeah, yeah, just yesterday, yeah, we can see that a, a yuan is squeezed, not squeezing, squeezed out the dollar in the Russian market, and even Commerçant, which is a very pro-Western, pro-liberal uh, uh, publication, they, and according to the outlets, estimate based on the data from Moscow Exchange, MOEX, the yuan was the most traded currency in February, displacing the US dollar from the top spot. Well, guess what? There will be also the India's rupees because India wants to pay and pays for Russian gas and oil in rupees. Russians gladly accept rupees because Russia would love to import a lot uh, uh, of things from uh, India and its variety of things. And when you begin to look at it and when you begin to look at this uh, real uh, economic picture, my gosh, <laughs> looking at... I mean, it's not just multi multipolarity. Multipolarity is a fait accompli. But we are talking about a complete disaster for these people. They uh, cannot even now go out and disclose that they sustain catastrophic defeat. It's strategic on such a level. We observed nothing like this before. Even the collapse of the Soviet Union doesn't even measure up to this situation. It's something unprecedented. Not to mention the fact that in terms of the violence, Vietnam War compared to uh, Ukraine today, a special military operation is a stroll in the park. It's chicken feed compared to what actually WSU sustains there on a daily basis. And when you look at this, when you sum it up uh, pretty much, and when you begin to look at how they react to all this in the West, you have to only say that, guys, it's, uh, how to put it politely, uh, I warned you, really go to the very first three posts on my blog from 2014, early 2015. I wrote there, and I will repeat it, and I will rub it into face for anybody, because, pardon me, I wasn't Cassandra, but I told the United States sustain in 2014 when they overthrew the and Europeans, obviously, Germany actually was the main driver. It's just that the success of the Maidan was uh, hijacked by Victoria Nuland and her cabal of the incompetence and fanatics. But the fact is that uh, they sustained a catastrophic defeat. I wrote about it. It's just that how it will manifest itself over what period of time, I didn't know that, but I knew that it will end the world as we know it, and it did. We already live in a completely different world. And uh, this is what I wanted to tell you today about, and I hope so you forgive me for changing a little bit of the direction of what I wanted to talk about, Russian Navy and all this bullshit, all those think tanks, be that Center for Naval Analysis or Jamestown or whatever the hell ran, publish about Russia, uh, I will concentrate on this. But it is a cottage industry. It is the cottage industry. I literally live and, you know, operate this cottage industry of debunking the bullshit in the West because it is... Uh, 
actually quite vital to do so because these idiots will literally uh, can literally run us into the world war three not understanding what they are doing and they do not understand what they are doing except for those few people in pentagon maybe in cia somewhere maybe elsewhere who do understand and try to convey the message that guys you know what break we're done we screwed up big time so this is my talk for you today and as always i really appreciate the support of my wonderful patrons and people who buy me jack daniel pardon myself uh, pardon uh coffee and guys as always those can, can support me please support me on patreon or buy me a coffee or two and as always assign, uh, subscribe to my channel and i really appreciate your support and i will talk to you later have a nice rest of the week bye bye